the amazing thing about militant atheists and their claim that God does not really exist is that they, in their denial of the reality of God, also end up denying that they really exist as real persons. In other words, given atheistic materialistic premises, there really is no such person named Richard Dawkins or Jerry Coyne. There is only an illusion of the brain who thinks, if illusions can think, that it is a person named Richard Dawkins or Jerry Coyne. Here is an interesting article by Dr. Paul Nelson entitled, Do You Like City? Fine, then let's dump methodological naturalism. In the article he states, Epistemology, how we know, and ontology, what exists, are both affected by methodological naturalism. If we say we cannot know that a mind caused X, laying down an epistemological boundary defined by methodological naturalism, then our ontology comprising real causes for X won't include minds. Methodological naturalism entails an ontology in which minds are the consequence of physics and thus can only be placeholders for a more detailed causal account in which physics is the only ultimate actor. You didn't write your email to me. Physics did, and informed the illusion of you of that event after the fact. Dr. Nelson goes on to say, That's crazy, you reply. I certainly did write my email. Okay, then. To what does the pronoun I in that sentence refer? Your personal agency? Your mind? Are you supernatural? You are certainly an intelligent cause, however, and your intelligence does not collapse into physics. If it does collapse, can be reduced without explanatory loss. We haven't the faintest idea how, which amounts to the same thing. To explain the effects you bring about in the world, such as your email, a real pattern, we must refer to you as a unique agent. Some features of intelligence must be irreducible to physics, because otherwise we're back to physics versus physics, and there's nothing for SETI to look for. In the following article, Human consciousness is m much more than mere brain activity. The author states, However, if you think the brain is a machine, then you are committed to saying that composing a sublime poem is as involuntary an activity as having an epileptic fit. In an article entitled, Why Tornadoes Running Backward Do Not Violate the Second Law, Granville Sewell, a professor of mathematics at the University of Texas, El Paso, asked, So how does the spontaneous rearrangement of matter on a rocky, barren planet into spaceships, jet airplanes, and nuclear power plants and libraries full of science texts and novels and supercomputers running partial differential equations represent a less obvious or less spectacular violation of the second law or at least the fundamental natural principle behind this law than tornadoes turning rubble into houses and cars can anyone even imagine a more spectacular violation? In the following video, Dr. Craig Hazen performs a miracle for an audience full of academics simply by raising his arm. 
So I go, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to perform a miracle, and I think that'll really get the conversation started. So I, I went out to the edge of the little stage, and I start to loosen up. Because, you know, you've got to loosen up to perform a miracle. You know? <laughs> I was just so stupid, you know, but I'm thinking this is a good way to go. And so I'm, uh, I'm loosening up, and I'm, you know, getting centered. And I, I look down, there's a woman with a camera. She's going to photograph the miracle. And I said, are you going to take a picture of the miracle? She goes, yeah. I go, good luck, you know. Actually, the picture of the miracle was on the front page of the Daily Hurricane newspaper the next day, you know. You know, professor performs miracle in science classroom, you know. So I'm loosening up, getting centered. I did one last peek. And people were all leaning forward in their chairs, you know, like, what's he going to do, a magic trick or a backflip? You know, they weren't about to blink because they didn't want to miss anything. And all I did was this. Whew. Other side. That's it. They, they actually looked like you do right now, like, yeah? Is that all you got? And so I said, thank you for entertaining my miraculous efforts up here. Um, now, I know some of you are a little bit skeptical that that would be miraculous, but, but uh, would you help me give a full scientific explanation then of my arm going up? And they were just, they were starting to get a little bit rowdy at that point. Like, oh, how did we get in here? Just give us the pizza for goodness sakes. We've had it with this guy already. I said, no, no, just calm down a minute. Somebody uh, help me understand how my arm went up because I used to teach physics and, and I know a little bit about Newton's laws of motion and, and I, was a, I was a body at rest. And with no warning, out of the blue, my arm goes up and and. It can't happen unless there's an outside force acting on it. And there was no, there was no fishing line in the ceiling pulling my arm up, right? There was, there was no wind blowing through the room blowing my arm up. Yet, out of the blue, whoosh, up goes my arm. Can somebody help me understand that in naturalistic terms rather than invoking miracles? They're shouting. It's, a, it's, it's becoming a bit of mayhem. This may not have been the best way to start the whole thing. But then... Uh, a guy stands up, and this guy was out of central casting, science guy, you know? He was balding, had big glasses, he had a pocket protector with overhead projector pens, a white lab coat down to his ankles, and he was tall, so it took him a while to stand up. He's like, <laughs> and, and you could tell the people around him were going, oh, Professor so-and-so has stood up, this is going to be good. Well, Professor so-and-so must have been a professor of physiology or something, because honestly, he gave an amazing rendition of the cascade of electrochemical events that take place for your arm to go up. There are sea fibers firing, and there's dendrites and axons, and there's potassium, and there's acetylcholine, and there's nerves that drop down to this thing, and they come out cervical gap X, and they drop down to your deltoid muscle and connect with the muscle there, and when actin and myosin, you know, when, when the... When the action potential reaches a certain point, acted and mice and cross over one another, and your arm goes up. But he did it deliberately, step by step, and it was really just brilliant, you know. And everybody's just in awe of Professor So and So. They're looking to be like, yeah, so there. And, and I said, really, that was tremendous. But clearly, he missed, you know, a, a major step. Can somebody help him? You know, the vaunted Professor So and So. No one was about to say anything. I got, come on, somebody help him. Now look, understand. I, I like what he said, but what got it going in the first place? I was a body at rest. What started the whole cascade of electrochemical events that caused my arm to go up? Help me understand that. Nobody in the room could help with that. And they started to yell at me, you know? It's kind of a din in the room. Uh, and I couldn't really hear what was going on because there were so many voices. But, but there was a woman sitting right next to the woman with a camera who took the picture of the miracle. And she was shouting something close enough to where I could hear it. And she was just pointing at me. And, and then I finally heard her. She said, you did it. You did it. And I said, what did you say? I said, stand up and tell everybody that. She stands up and she goes, he did it. And I said, that's exactly right. I did it. You see, I am not my body. I am tightly associated with this body. In fact, I can make it do all kinds of things, you know? And so can you. And, and I submit to you here tonight that if you hold to a worldview that really can't make sense of this, 
you might need to go get a new worldview. Besides moving your body around, the mind also has been shown to have the causal power to change your brain. It's called brain plasticity. And Jeffrey Swartz has done a lot of work in this area. As well, the mind has now been shown to be able to reach all the way down and affect the expressions of genes. This is simply impossible given materialistic premises. As well, Dean Radin, who has done a lot of work on consciousness at Princeton University in the past, has now done an experiment that shows that conscious intention can have a statistically significant effect on the double slit experiment. In the following article, a professor speaks about the superiority of agent causality over the blind causality of atheists. Well, there were two great holes in my argument about the irrelevance of God. The first was that in order to attack free will, I had to suppose that I understood causality, that I understood cause and effect. I supposed causation to be less mysterious than volition, the exercise of the will. Now, if anything, the truth of the matter is the other way around, isn't it? I experience a rational connection between my willing to do something and my doing it. I actually have inside knowledge of that connection. But between the falling apple and the dirt underneath, I have no experience of connection. I have no inside knowledge of being an apple. Why does it fall? We don't know. Because of gravity, you say. Well, no. Gravity is merely the name of the phenomenon, not its explanation. But gravity has laws, you say. Our scientists have worked out those laws. Yes, they have, and that was an, an incredible intellectual feat. But its laws don't explain it. They merely describe it more precisely. But no, no, space is curved, you say. No, that's only a geometrical way of presenting the same description. Instead of presenting it in equations, you present it in pictures, all right? But you're still only describing it. You're not explaining it. The other hole in my reasoning was cruder. If my imprisonment in a blind causality really did make my reasoning so unreliable that I couldn't trust my beliefs, then by the same token, I shouldn't have trusted my belief that I was imprisoned in a blind causality. But in that case, I had no business denying free will and personal responsibility in the first place. In the following video, Dr. William Lane Craig points out that metaphysical naturalism is reducto ad absurdum on at least eight points. What can we say about metaphysical naturalism? Well, again, I want to make two points. First, my arguments for the existence of God show that metaphysical naturalism is not true. There is a personal, transcendent reality beyond the physical universe. But secondly, I think that metaphysical naturalism is so contrary to reason and experience as to be absurd. And in the following arguments, the first premise in every case is taken from Dr. Rosenberg's own book. So first, the argument from intentionality. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I cannot think about anything. That's because there are no intentional states. But two, I am thinking about naturalism, from which it follows, three, therefore, naturalism is not true. 
So if you think that you ever think about anything, you should conclude that naturalism is false. Second, the argument from meaning. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, no sentence has any meaning. And he says that all the book sentences in his own book are in fact meaningless. But premise two, premise one has meaning. We all understood it. And therefore it follows that three, naturalism is not true. Third, argument from truth. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, there are no true sentences. And that's because they're all meaningless. But two, premise one is true. That's what the naturalist believes and asserts, from which it follows three, therefore naturalism is not true. Fourth, the argument from moral praise and blame. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, then I am not morally praiseworthy or blameworthy for any of my actions because, as I said, on his view, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But two, I am morally praiseworthy and blameworthy for at least some of my actions. If you think that you've ever done something truly wrong or truly good, then you should conclude that three, therefore, naturalism is not true. Fifth, the argument from freedom. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not do anything freely. Everything is determined. But two, I can freely agree or disagree with premise one, from which it follows three, therefore, naturalism is not true. Sixth, the argument from purpose. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not plan to do anything. But two, I planned to come to tonight's debate. That's why I'm here. From which it follows three, therefore naturalism is not true. Seventh, the argument from enduring. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not endure for two moments of time. But two, I have been sitting here for more than a minute. If you think that you're the same person who walked into the room tonight, then you should agree that three, therefore naturalism, is not true. And finally, the argument from personal existence. This is perhaps the coup de grace against naturalism. According to Dr. Rosenberg, if naturalism is true, I do not exist. He says there are no selves, there are no persons, no first person perspectives. But two, I do exist. I know this as certainly as I know anything from which it follows, therefore, naturalism is not true. In a word, metaphysical naturalism is absurd. And notice that my argument is not that it is unappealing. Rather, it is that metaphysical naturalism flies in the face of reason and experience it's and is really therefore... It's rocket science. It's not enough to say that design is a more likely scenario to explain a world full of well-designed things. It strikes me as urgent to insist that you not allow your mind to surrender the absolute clarity that all complex and magnificent things were made that way. Once you allow the intellect to consider that an elaborate organism with trillions of microscopic interactive components can be an accident, you have essentially lost your mind.